Hello everyone and welcome back to my flight around the world in the F-104 by Sim Skunk Works. Here we have a flight from Rome to Alexandria. I think I previously said Cairo. I had originally planned for Cairo, but as you can see, uh, this is quite a stretch all on its own. And trying to get to Cairo probably was out of our capabilities as the plane is configured right now. So I decided to fly to Alexandria instead. And here we go. So of course we're going to need the tip and pylon tanks. We're fully fueled. And again, with the Simskonk Works F-104, those external tanks do create drag. And maybe a little bit more than they ought to, I don't know. But here we go. It certainly feels like that off of takeoff as I sort of get, have trouble getting it off the ground here all the time without scraping the tail. Scraping the tail happens, I'll remind you. And so I'm very gingerly about trying to rotate off of the runway there. And here we go. And uh, we're exiting from Flumicino, L-I-R-F, and that's a little bit off to the side from Rome itself. And Rome is over to the left, well, oh, on the upper portion of the image to the left with respect to the plane uh, over there. But we're not getting a particularly good view because, again, the F-104 is not a sightseeing plane, and we're just going to be taking things at high altitude for the most part. So, over Italy here, we will be able to see some sights from this altitude and in fact more on this flight than usual for instance we have Vesuvius there I think I have a mod that's uh, enhancing Vesuvius which is why it doesn't quite blend in with the surrounding areas it's sort of obviously a square there uh, that was made by the mod maybe I should just abandon that idea uh, that mod it might make it stand out too much and I should just have the more blended version. As I dump the pylon tanks there, you see I, I have to select it with those lights first in order to dump them and you have to bind a certain key in order to make that happen. Once we've dumped the pylon tanks, I go past the speed of sound. And so there's the optimal way I've found of flying this particular version of the F-104. Again, there may be debate about whether this F-104 by Simskunk Works is accurate to the real thing, but uh, I'm just gonna tell you how I fly this one. So, just with the tip tanks, and we're running out of the boot of Italy here, as we will go across the Mediterranean to Egypt. We could have gone a little bit closer to Greece than I ultimately did, but I decided to just make a straight line because, again, this is sort of stretching the F-104 a little bit, and I actually wanted to reach my destination. So there we go. Uh, somebody said that the F-104 looks unnatural without the wingtip tanks. Well, I, I disagree with that. Um, but it looks good with the wingtip tanks and without the wingtip tanks. And we just lost the wingtip tanks. So there it is. No wingtip tanks. And a grease to our left. Once again, while we have the wingtip tanks, the max speed is about Mach 1.7, but without them it's Mach 1.8 to 1.9, but we don't really get to Mach 2 in our situation here. I tried to activate the autopilot a few times, but didn't want to cooperate. Uh, between these occasions, uh, I'm cutting it out, but I was trying various things in order to try and fix the situation. Uh, maybe get it more level first or stuff like that, change the trim. Uh, actually, on a different occasion, I found that the situation with the trim didn't seem to matter. I had uh, set the trim to uh, take off, uh, you know, so that the green lights are all on, but that didn't help the autopilot maintain stability either as we pass by Crete here. So, yeah, it's sort of random when it decides to wobble, as far as I can tell. Though, obviously, starting in a more stable position in theory should help. And so we are approaching Alexandria here and the mouth of the Nile. So this was the seventh flight in the series of a planned 28 and we'll have the eighth and ninth flight. The eighth and ninth flight that are included in this video will have us going down the Nile or up the Nile, technically up the Nile, but south. Uh, so yeah, that is the main adventure for this one, which will produce more sights than we've seen from some of the other flights, given that they were across the Atlantic, for instance. Okay, so landing at Alexandria, H-E-B-A. This is unfortunately not an airport that has much scenery around it. 
And of course, Alexandria was once host to one of the Seven Wonders of the World, the Lighthouse and potentially the Great Library, if you count that one, uh, depending on whether he played Civilization or not. But uh, unfortunately, those, of course, got destroyed. So here we are. Well, the vegetation is suitable, I suppose. And there's no particular terminal that I could see, so I just parked over here. Maybe the terminal is on the other side. So anyway, switching it off, we see the logbook entry eventually, whenever it pops up. And there we have it, one hour and 19 minutes, which is longish for one of these flights with the F-104. And next up, we go to Khartoum. And so down to now we go, and we will pass by the pyramids, I'll point them out. And so, HSSK. Khartoum is where the two main branches of the Nile converge, uh, the White Nile and the Blue Nile, derived from the Arab names for those branches at Khartoum. So, here we go, taking off from Alexandria. And that is what Alexandria looks like as we turn towards Cairo here. I actually took off in the wrong direction. That's the coastal side of Alexandria with the mouth of the Nile in the distance. That little modded uh, FSPM VFR map is so much better than the regular in-game VFR map. Of course, it's using OpenStreetMap stuff, but very helpful. And here I'm lighting the afterburner over Egypt. As there is Cairo, and at my nose you can sort of see the pyramids. We're really high right now, but uh, it's passing by the left side of the nose. They are passing by the left side of the nose, the pyramids. So you can spot them there. Very prominent. I mean, of course, they say you can see them from space, and well, at least at this site, you can see them pretty easily. And again, another view of them passing by the left side of the nose. The Greek pyramids at Giza. And we continue. The Nile is very definite. I mean, you can't miss it. Uh, the rest of the country is very, very dry. In his Discworld novel, Pyramids, Terry Pratchett sort of recreated Egypt, a fantastical version of Egypt on the Discworld, the flat world. And uh, he noted that it was basically a country that was 400 miles long and 20 miles wide or something like that. I forget whether it was 10 or 20, whatever. But basically this is the, the 20 miles wide or so, the area right around the Nile. The Nile actually doesn't carry as much water as some other rivers do, uh, even in Africa. It's just really, really long. Of course, this portion of the Nile is the product of the Aswan Dam. The Aswan Dam uh, prevents a lot of the flow and regulates the flooding that historically would have occurred. And so we don't see the full flow of the Nile and that allows people to build around it without worrying about getting flooded all the time. Uh, so that's good, and of course the dam provides electricity, and it did displace people. We won't pass by the dam itself, uh, but we will pass over the lake it produced, Lake Nasser. As you continue to see it stretching behind us there. It's interesting that uh, sort of the greenery is all on one side of the river, really, and I was unsure about why that is, so I'm sure there's a reason. We depart from the river because I'm going on a straight line course because I don't have that much range to try and follow the river. But we keep seeing it on the horizon anyway. You can see it's skirting along there and eventually we'll meet up again with it uh, as we pass over Lake Nassau, which is what this is. So this is the lake produced by the Aswan Dam. I don't remember what that airport is. It's been a while since I made the flight, but I'm sure it'd be easy to find out that there can't be too many airports right next to Lake Nasser. You can sort of see a borderline between Egypt and Sudan in the photo scenery here. You can see the line that basically marks out the border because I guess the aerial shots were taken separately. I do like this kind of landscape even though it's barren and probably uninhabitable uh, because it looks very varied. It's interesting to look at as opposed to endless cropland. Sorry, cropland. I know you're useful and everything, but you're boring to look at sometimes. 
Uh, but this is, yeah, just more colorful and interesting. And as you can see, some of the former uh, tributaries into the Nile there. Or former courses of the Nile. And yeah, this is a different sort of look to the place as we approach Khartoum in Sudan. And on this flight, I managed to use the autopilot. I engaged it, and that's why the altitude was being held that precisely. Otherwise, manually, I would be able to do that with the trim. But yeah, there I disengaged the autopilot, and we begin descending into Khartoum. So this is the Nile, and then beyond Khartoum, there's the Blue Nile that goes into Ethiopia, and the White Nile that goes further south, ultimately to Lake Victoria, though. Um, technically those names are only particular stretches of the Nile and then it changes name like there's the Victoria Nile and stuff like that. that part that's the particular branch that goes into Lake Victoria. And so uh, I don't know why I was so wobbly coming into Khartoum. I mean I was lined up really really far away. It was really easy to see the airport and everything. I don't know what happened here. But here we are at HSSK. Well, as long as we land, I suppose. It's a tough plane to land. And here I do find a parking spot, and there are buildings and everything. A little bit more populated than Alexandria, as we see a flight of 1 hour and 12 minutes there. And on to Entebbe International in Uganda. This is outside of Kampala. And this is on the shores of Lake Victoria. So basically the source of the Nile. We'll call it the source of the Nile. I mean, of course, there's multiple sources of the Nile. There's the uh, Blue Nile branch and everything. And actually, the Blue Nile carries more water in than the White, White Nile does. It's just that the White Nile is longer, and so it's further away from the mouth. So normally, I guess they judge the source of the Nile as the furthest point away from the mouth that generates water. I, I, I don't know what the rules are, but they are still debating what the actual source of the Nile is, so whatever. Anyway, the point is I'm satisfied with Lake Victoria as the like, other end of the Nile from the mouth. I'm sure I flew over the convergence of the White Nile and Blue Nile, but for some reason I lost that in editing. Uh, maybe it wasn't that interesting. Oh no, I think you can see it in the back there. Maybe. Alright. Anyway, the point is the plane looks wonderful. <laughs> As we continue on south, the Nile looks a lot less helpful down here than it did in Egypt, doesn't it? Well, part of that is just the uh, climate. Uh, this is much more Saharan. It's much more inland than Egypt. Egypt's got the Mediterranean and the uh, Red Sea. There's the politics of it, but also this part still floods. It's not dammed up. I don't know, there was that, that's a stretch of land there that's very peculiar on one of those branches of the Nile. And I, I don't know how that works out, but there's definitely farmland on it. That's a weird sort of uh, patch of land there, but yeah, probably because of the flooding it's a little bit hard to make anything reliable on the banks of the, of the Nile. Which is why the damming occurred up north as well. This is a different sort of orangish pattern that we've got here. A lot of it was probably previous flows of the Nile as it changed its course. It's easy to pretend that the course of a river is, like, static. I mean, of course, it flows, but I mean, where it flows, we pretend it's static because we control it rather tightly, or try to, these days. But, generally speaking, left to its own natural devices, it'll go all over the place. And you see that on the landscape around rivers. Of course, some of the features might be produced by other things, but generally around rivers, the features are produced by the river. Uh, so, yeah, here we continue on climbing as I've just got the wingtip tanks and I pass the speed of sound here. I've done the dip to break the speed of sound and now remains prominent. And you can see it's not a super wide river here. And again, uh, a lot of the water comes from the Blue Nile coming from Ethiopia. But just in general, the Nile just doesn't carry that much water compared to some of the other rivers. Down here, the photo scenery has less quality, unfortunately. Uh, they just don't take aerial photos or satellite photography of this area very often, I guess, as I drop the wingtip tanks. 
hopefully not disturbing anybody with that, or the fact that I'm past the speed sound with my sonic boom, and we're cruising right along. The sort of lack of detail on the ground scenery meant that in certain shots it seemed like I was flying higher than I was. I'm still at about 46,000 feet here. The clouds are at least making it seem a little bit more restrained in this location. That was the first time we saw clouds. I am flying with real world weather throughout all this, even though I'm not using the real time. Real time would mean it would be dark for many of these flights. So I am using real world weather though, and it really was clear for a lot of flights. This shot in particular uh, makes it seem like I'm flying really high up, but I think it's mainly because of the lack of ground detail. But the haze, the haze is just right for that too. So this in front of us is Lake Kyoga. And it is just north of Lake Victoria. And so we're following the branch of the river, the Victoria Nile, that flows from Lake Kyoga into Lake Victoria. Well, not I, I wouldn't say follow it. Uh, because actually we have to divert a little bit westward to Kampala. The actual junction between the Victoria Nile and Lake Victoria is further to the east. So we depart from the Nile actually and head towards Kampala and Entebbe in particular. Entebbe is right on Lake Victoria. Entebbe International is one of those international airports that's like 20 miles away from the city. Here, a rare external view as I'm trying to land. Normally when I'm trying to land, I don't want to leave the cockpit. It's a little bit rough, but I felt confident enough to take the external view there of the F-104 prior to landing. And here we are coming in. Altitude, as you can see, is 3,700 feet or so. Actually, probably my altimeter is a little bit misconfigured. I think it's 3,780 feet altitude at Entebbe International. So that's that for this flight. This was the ninth flight, so that was flights 7 through 9. We had a little trip up the Nile, and we will continue on through a part of Africa to Madagascar, and then we'll be crossing the Indian Ocean. So that's the plan. And Entebbe International is a handcrafted airport, so we have a lot of details, including the word Entebbe on to, off to the side there. But here I am parking and we will see the logbook. But with that, with the logbook entry, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.